In terms of mythological creatures, the werewolf is probably one of my favourite ideas because it's such a simple premise. It's a guy who transforms into a giant wolf and eats people. Yeah, there's a couple of variations from time to time, whether it be design choices, what they're weak to, or even if they can control when they want to change or not. However, I also acknowledge that, rather ironically, werewolves are always going to be the underdogs to vampires when it comes to humanoid monsters, because you can do so much more with them. Besides the sharp teeth and pale skin, they usually look identical to humans, and besides delving into madness the longer they go without drinking blood, they usually act like people, having the sanity and intelligence to present some interesting personalities on screen. Also, there's just the sex appeal. Have sex. Most of the time in media, werewolves don't have this. They behave like wild beasts that need to hunt and kill everything. And as such, their human sides and their wolf sides are treated almost like a form of multiple personality disorder, which limits what you can do with them in a story. Of course, the upside to having wild beasts that want to eat you no matter the cost and possess an extreme level of violence and rage really helps to make good horror movies. And because of this, I want to talk about an absolutely terrific horror movie that I feel doesn't get the appreciation that it deserves. Dog Soldiers is about a group of British soldiers that are transported to the Scottish Highlands to take part in a training exercise, only for this to go horribly wrong when they slowly start getting picked off one by one by a group of werewolves that live in the isolated areas of Scotland. We follow the group as they desperately try to find a way to get in contact with the outside world or to try and find a vehicle they can use to escape, all the while the wolves are hot on their tracks. It's a relatively small film in terms of scope, it only cost them about two and a bit million to make, but the set and costume designs look really good, the props for the guns and equipment are very realistic, and the acting is just very enjoyable. Now listen up, I'm gonna make this quick and to the point, because just like you, all I wanna do is get home, jump into a warm bed with a nice hot woman, and watch the footy. Planning on scoring, Sarge? Yeah, well mind you don't foul her in the penalty box. Oh, all right, button it, private parts. Of all the actors in the film, the three that most people will recognise is Kevin McKidd, who would play our main protagonist Cooper and would later go on to voice one of the most memorable Call of Duty characters Activision has ever made. So, no, not that shit one, the better one. There we go. We also have Sean Pertry playing the Sarge of the group, who people may remember as the scientist that gets slowly cooked alive and eaten in Doomsday, and as the most underappreciated live action Alfred Pennyworth I think we've ever had. Right, tell me where Bruce Wayne is. Well, I guarantee you'll regret it. Alfred, I've got this. Good cop, bad cop. That routine's a bit tired, isn't it, gentlemen? Yeah, but I'm not a cop, am I? <laughs> I'm a butler. And then we have Captain Ryan, an antagonistic individual who knows a lot more than he lets on, played by Liam Cunningham, who would later go on to be one of the best actors in a TV show that slowly started to castrate itself. I loved that girl, like she was my own. She was good, she was kind, and you killed her! There are several reasons to watch this film, and I'll try and explain it in a way that gives you a good idea of what I'm talking about without spoiling too many things. Reason number one, you see a man fist fight a werewolf. Reason number two, there's a lot of good characters, good banter, dialogue and conflict between the characters on screen. These people feel like actual characters with real experiences, even the characters that don't get much time to stand out, and their character traits are emphasised several times throughout the film. For instance, Terry is younger, is generally less organised than the others, and prone to not thinking clearly and rationally. And as such, you see how this causes problems for both him and the squad. Cooper, on the other hand, is good enough to have been on special forces, but refused to join when it involved killing a dog for no clear reason. As such, throughout the movie, Cooper is quick to point out details about their surroundings, come up with ideas rather quickly, and is quick to act, but still holds a deep camaraderie with his squad, and alongside the Sarge, tries his best to ensure morale in the group stays high. Terry, where you at? Stick the kettle on. Could all do with the brew. Overall, these just feel like people. The film is set on the same day that England was about to verse Germany in the World Cup, and as such, several characters comment about the fact that they want to watch the football. Piss now. Close save, eh, Jack? Well, this shite is totally born. The most important football match of my life is playing tonight, and I'm stuck up the backside of beyond without so much as a six-pack or a telly. 
And then as they're trekking through the Scottish Highlands later on, because they're just bored and they need something to do, every single one of them decide to just whistle the English football anthem. It's just small little character moments like that that make these characters stand out. There's also a nice little bonding scene near the start when they're around a campfire and they're just exchanging stories and talking like people. Yes, you know that a lot of these people are going to die and some of them don't get enough development to be true major characters, but they're still well written, even as side pieces. Number 3. There's a lot of good thematic imagery to accompany the characters. A good example is at the start of the film, when Cooper is training to join the special forces. Cooper passes every single test that he believes he will need to pass in order to join the special forces, but Captain Ryan decides that he needs to pass one more test in order to join them. He instructs Cooper to kill a military dog that was accompanying them, despite the fact that the dog was loyal and wasn't harming anyone. Cooper refuses, punches Ryan for killing the dog, and shows great disdain for him throughout the film. Ryan, meanwhile, kills the dog for no reason without mercy, purely because that's what he wants, showing the complete lack of loyalty towards everyone but himself. The way these individuals treat the dog is a thematic representation of how they would treat other characters throughout the story. Number 4. Subtle Foreshadowing There's a lot of small cues in the story that you can look back on on a rewatch and see how it sets everything up. Whether it be character traits, music cues, or items established at the beginning of the story that come into play later. Three examples that I'm going to list would be the name of the family that owns the house the soldiers end up in, what Megan plays on the piano, and the way that Ryan looks at himself in the mirror. Number five, you see a werewolf, a giant hulking mass of muscle, three times as strong as a man armed with sharp teeth and claws, get its ass kicked in a fist fight. Number 6. The werewolves in this film are quite different to what you usually see in a lot of media. Usually a werewolf is just angry and hungry, charging in and attacking anything it comes across without thinking. But this movie highlights several times that these aren't just hungry killers, but they're intelligent as well. They understand the importance of vehicles and weapons, sabotaging them to keep the group with less options. They stay close enough to the group so they can keep an eye on them, but far enough away so they can run away from gunfire. They employ different tactics and distractions to keep the group on their toes and pick them off when they see an opportunity. Honestly, I wish we got to see werewolves be this intelligent more often in fiction, because it throws all predictability out the window and makes you guess what they're going to do next. Number 7. There's quite a lot of jokes in this film for a film that's so bleak and dark. I'm actually surprised by the amount of dark humour this film has, even up to the climax. One of the main ones is Sarge after he gets injured. He receives a wound around his stomach, causing his intestines to fall out. So Cooper just comes along and shoves them back in before carrying him to his feet. And then later, when they finally have managed to bandage him up, Sam, a dog they find hiding in the house, comes over to Sarge and starts trying to play with and chew his bloodied bandages while Sarge screams in pain. Another good one is when they try and escape in a car, only for the car to have been ripped apart by the werewolves. As they retreat back into the house, a werewolf nearly manages to get through the front door and kill them. After fighting it off and getting the door shut, Cooper tells the other soldiers to secure a perimeter and then asks Terry if he's alright. And how does Terry respond? Terry, you okay? Got a real craving for a kebab? There's just something so funny about a man who, in one of the worst experiences anyone could possibly go through, just expresses that at that moment, he just wants a kebab. Number 8. The film knows when to use music, sound effects, and silence. There's several times during the film that the sound design really helps to immerse you in the world and feel the suspense of the characters. A standout scene is what happens when they find Captain Ryan and what remains of the rest of his men. When the group first arrives at the camp and discovers the go on the destroyed equipment, there's a sinister music playing in the background, helping to emphasise the unease that the soldiers feel upon discovering the wreckage. The music then fades as the group search the camp and find Captain Ryan, showing them struggling to understand what has happened and what has happened to the captain. As the group continues to try and call for help, only to discover none of the radios are working, and an unhinged Ryan continues to shout about how there was only supposed to be one of them, the music slowly begins to creep back up, as Spoons informs the rest of the group that it's approaching nighttime. The music cuts out as Sarge tries to get the group to stay focused, only for Ryan to tell them that they need to run for their lives before they're ripped apart. 
As Sarge tries to tell him to stop scaring the rest of his soldiers, he is cut off by a man screaming in the distance, only for those screams to be replaced with howls. As the group begins to flee for their lives, the music picks back up again, this time as a fast-paced violin piece to emphasise the horror they're running from. This is only one example of the brilliant sound design in this film. Number 9. There's this guy called Spoons, right? And like me, he's from Durham, a place up north that's as sophisticated as Yorkshire, but the people are as mad as Geordies. You understand that? Okay, so this absolute madman is in a kitchen with a werewolf, right? And he's got no weapons. So what does he do? He begins to box the ever-loving shit out of it. If you tell me that the idea of a crazy Northman beating the shit out of a werewolf and winning isn't one of the best movie ideas you've ever heard, you're lying. So yeah, I just highly recommend watching this movie. It's got a good set of actors, set designs, costume designs, the action is decent enough, the music gets the job done, and it's only an hour and 45 minutes long. So the pacing is good and it won't take up too much of your time if you just want a decent, quick watch of something. I think the most tragic thing about this is that, despite doubling its budget and despite how good the film is, we're most likely never getting anything else after this film. The original version released in 2002, and there's never been any successful spin-off or sequel, mostly due to the fact that the director, Neil Marshall, doesn't own the rights to it anymore, and the people who do don't seem to want to do anything with it. Which is a shame because this was Neil's pet project that he spent six years on writing, directing and editing, and the fact that so much passion didn't get a sequel is such a shame to me. Still, at least it helped to get his career sorted. He went on to make some well-known cult films like Doomsday and the first Descent movie, and then went on to direct Season 4, Episode 9 of Game of Thrones, The Watchers on the Wall, an episode that most Game of Thrones fans will say is in the top 5 best episodes of the entire series. Which is good, because he then went on to make Hellboy, so he kinda needed something to balance his karma out. Thanks for watching lads and lasses, hopefully I've brought a really good horror film to your attention, and I really do hope you check it out. If you like this video, please consider liking, subscribing and sharing. If you really enjoy my work, please consider watching some of my other videos or donating to my Patreon. But overall, I just hope you had a great day, and hopefully I'll see you in the next video.